this morning, uh, which is Psalm 80, verses 1 through 7. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth in the presence of Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. Stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears, and you've given them tears to drink in the desert. You make us the scorn of your neighbors, and your enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God, let us let your name shine, and we may rest Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. You may be seated. Scripture lesson this morning is taken from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 29 through chapter 12, verse 2. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, after attempted, they drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down, after they were encompassed about seven days. By faith, the harlot, he had perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies of peace. And what I more say, for time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and of Samson and of David and also of Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness they were made strong, like battle, and fight turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Women conceived their dead graves to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they had might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial and cruel mockings, starving. Moreover, of bonds and imprisonment, they were stoned, they were sung asunder. Were tempted, were tempted, were slain with sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in the desert and in the mountains and in the dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better things for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Wherefore, seeing we also are surrounded about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is 
sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hearing me, reading the word of God. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the words that were read this morning. And we just pray that your word be spoken and your word be heard. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I am willing to go out on a limb and say that each one of you here this morning is here as a result of someone else's faith. I know in my own life I have many examples of faithful believers who come, who came before me and they poured their faith into me. And I was fortunate enough to grow up in a home with parents and even have grandparents who just loved Jesus and wanted me to grow in the faith that they held close to their own hearts. As a result of being raised in the church my whole life, I have come in contact with many faithful believers who influenced me and they continue to influence me to this day. And the great thing about church is that each church is a little bit different, but we are all part of this big family of God. And it is a, a, a very diverse group of people. And I have had the benefit of, of attending many different churches over my short life and, and have come in contact with, with great uh, believers. So as I was preparing this sermon, I was thinking of, of those people. I think, uh, first I think of my grandmother, who I had uh, the honor of speaking at her funeral a few years ago, and I shared there, what I'm going to share with you now, um, something that she would always do with us. My grandma Moser was a very faithful person, uh, who showed up to church every Sunday and, and was very actively involved in her church. And she would give us gentle reminders as we would leave her house to always have joy. And she taught us that joy was this acronym which meant Jesus first. And I talked about that last week. We put Jesus first and ourselves last. Right? So she would always say, have, remember to have joy, to put Jesus first and others second and yourself last. And that has stuck with me all of these years. And I even write it to, to kids as a youth pastor. Um, one of the sad things about leaving Myersville was writing notes to each of my kids and I say my kids they they weren't my kids but they they become a part of you when you're when you're teaching them in in youth group and in Sunday school and on each on each one of those cards I would write remember to have joy and that's what I mean so if I write you a, a, a note and you see that I use the word joy that's really I am thinking and honoring my grandmother's faith I also think of a man who was very active at Asbury United Methodist Church on Jonathan Street in Hagerstown that we attended for many, uh, many years ago. We attended there as mission disciples. And um, I remember Mr. Mosby as a faithful person, but he came uh, and to to understand his faith, I think, later in his life, and he began a prison ministry, and it was all stemmed from him owning a, a liquor store on Jonathan Street. And 
he unfortunately was robbed and stabbed by an unknown assailant to him. And he forgave that guy who attacked him and almost killed him. And he shared that his testimony. I remember, I think I was only maybe 12 or 13 hearing his testimony about how he started his prison ministry because he forgave the guy who almost took his life. And I think, wow, if only I had a faith like Mr. Mosby. And I think of him often. And then a person that you will probably hear me talk about a whole lot, and I know I have brought her name up before, is Jeanette Kuhn, who was very influential in my faith, especially uh, as a older teenager and young adult, and just beginning a journey of being a youth director. And I remember sitting in her house and having great conversations. And she just seemed like one of the wisest people that I knew. She, she knew uh, history of this mountain and of the families here. And, and she told me history of my own family I had no clue about. Um, and then she did some awesome things like she cared for Ronald Reagan when he was president and he was in the hospital because he was attacked and you know I thought man what a what a great story that is and, and she just she never boasted about that one time you know and the gifts that Ronald Reagan and his wife uh, gave her she just kept in a little drawer on, in a desk in her living room you know where other people might have you know put that out on display and one of the things uh, that I received when she passed on was a box of her books and her Bibles that her brother George gave me. And actually, uh, I use her Bible uh, as one of my Bibles as I prepare for my sermons every Sunday because she was great at putting little notes in the Bible and underlining things. So I use her Bibles as, okay, I studied and this is what I see. Now let me see what Jeanette is saying. And, and that is a great, uh, a great re resource that I have. And maybe you have people like that too in your life that you can point to that has, has been influential in your faith. And maybe some of those people are sitting in this sanctuary today. And even if you weren't raised in the church, like like me and others, there is probably somebody in your life that shared their faith with you who influenced you or influenced your own life. Or perhaps it was the faith that we read of the apostles and the stories we see in the Bible and the promise of eternal life when we read the gospel lessons. So I want you to think about that person who, who it is that, that has influenced your life. And I want you to give thanks to God for those good and faithful servants who helped grow the kingdom of God. In our scripture that uh, Don read for us this morning out of Hebrews, we see the writer, the writer here is addressing a group of Jewish believers. Thus is why it's called the book of Hebrews. The writer is encouraging them to put their faith in Jesus. So it is a scripture that we can gain a lot of even to this day. And in the scripture, there is lots of examples of the faithful who came before Jesus' time, who were saved by their own faith in God. In fact, the 11th chapter of Hebrews is known as the faith chapter. And you will see uh, in our scripture readings that are suggested for this week, um, and if you, if you do those, you will end up reading the whole chapter of, uh, of Hebrews. That was a small portion was read this morning. And uh, you will see that by faith is mentioned a whole lot of times. 
Actually, it's mentioned 22 times to be exact. Hebrews 11 is like a genealogy of the family of faith from Adam leading up to the New Testament. These men and women mentioned here would have been very familiar to the audience that this letter was written to, and they are familiar to us as well. It demonstrates the importance of believers today to study the Old Testament, to know really where we come from. The people of faith in the Old Testament, they were looking forward to Jesus. And their eyes were on a Messiah that was promised. And the writer of Hebrews and those who were new to the Christian faith, as well as us here today, our eyes are looking backwards to Jesus. So the Old and the New Testament points to each other. And we are all focused on the one thing, a Savior that this world needs. So as so we here as Christians, we have the benefit, as the old saying is, of hindsight is 2020. But there are people that we know who do not know who Jesus is. And we have the unique responsibility to bring the light of Christ to those people, to show them love and respect, to lead them maybe to the place that we are now. So as we look at the book of Hebrews, there was some debate about who the author of this letter was. But we can see evidence in the book that it was written by a second-generation Christian. This means that whoever wrote this book probably was someone who was not a direct witness to Jesus' ministry and his death and resurrection. We can assume that they were most likely Jewish because they were very familiar with the Jewish teaching and scriptures. They also demonstrate through research and evidence of who Jesus was using eyewitness accounts of those who saw and believed Jesus was the Messiah. The writer is giving evidence here in this passage that those Jewish forebearers were saved by their faith. And we should follow in their footsteps because Jesus brought the gospel to all people. We see evidence that our God works, that our good works and, uh, and, uh, and our actions do not save us. It is our faith that produces good fruits. So as United Methodists, our Wesleyan tradition teaches us that we must first accept Jesus, what Jesus has already done for us on the cross. This acceptance is the first step out in faith. Because we are not witnesses of that crucifixion and his resurrection from the grave, but we must go on the testimonies of others and what we see as God works through our lives. In faith, we continue to be sanctified and justified. We continue to grow and be refined to be more like Jesus. Our eyes should be on Jesus, the one who died for our sins. If we hold on to our sins or the things of this world, we easily take our eyes off of Jesus. And as I've been saying in the past few weeks, we must do away with that stuff, the sin that holds us back, that threatens a perfect relationship with Jesus. Our sins and the storing up of the worldly treasures that is not heavenly will trip us up and it will drag us down. And we must push through to finish the race strong. We are reminded of our own faith when we hear Jesus tell Thomas 
that blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, as we read in John 20. Thomas, he had the benefit of seeing Jesus, didn't he? He saw that Jesus was crucified on the cross for all of our sins and came back from the grave three days later. Thomas got to touch the wounds in his hands and his feet that were made by the nails. And for Thomas, that would be easy to believe. For some people today, it might be hard to follow a man they have never met. But for others, it is easy to keep their eyes on Jesus because we see God at work in our lives. And we see God through the love of others. We see God through our family and those that are our church family. As Christians, we are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus who love God and love our neighbors. We must continue to carry on the belief of those who came before us. We must fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, as Hebrews 12, 2 says. Those who came before us, their faith and their testimony, it lives on in us. During the days of Jesus, the Jewish faith would have been at a point where more emphasis was put on keeping the law, doing the stuff, going through the motions, and not really fully relying on our faith. As Christians, we are guilty of doing that too. I know I am guilty of doing that. As I have grown in my faith, I have said a lot that God's got this. Right? When we go through our ups and our downs, I have just leaned on God and said, God, whatever you want me to do. And I know sometimes there's some, there's some things that, that I even, when I talk with Jessica about, well, I think God's saying we should do this. She makes sure that I'm really sure, you know. When out of the blue, God tells me we should sell our house. Where are we going to live? God's got this, right? When I went through being laid off from my job, I was worried. But you know what I said to myself? God's got this. And as I look back through my life, I see that God had a lot going on in my life. God had me, and he cared for me, even though life is not easy. And we quickly slide back into our bad habits, and we need to be reminded that we are called the children of God. And God's got that too. He has our sins. And we just need to give them over to him. We are like the athlete here. As we see this image in Hebrews. That we are to train daily to run the race. And friends, our race isn't a short one. And it's not one that we just sprint on a Sunday morning for a few minutes and then go home. The race that God has for us is a marathon. And we are all training for it and should be training for it daily. Our faith in Jesus is, is not short. Our faith should be long and we should share it with others. Our faith gets us through the ups and downs, and we have a great team of believers alongside us that can help us get through those hard times, and we can share in the good times with. 
All people of faith have focused on God's promises, the fulfillment of God's promises, as it is embodied in Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. And those who have focused on the one and only Messiah can embrace the promise of eternal life. And we should strive to keep our eyes on Jesus. We should all want to hear at the end of our race those words that, we, that the master said to the servant in Matthew 25, verse 23. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful. You will learn that I really enjoy the sport of motocross. Um, I like going to the races. I like watching them on TV. And I just think those guys are probably some of the toughest athletes that exist. You see these guys, they fall off their bikes. They have horrible crashes. They break bones and collarbones and they get back up and they keep going. So I am nowhere near a motocross athlete. But when I was younger, I, I, like my brothers, learned to ride dirt bikes. And I enjoyed it. Didn't enjoy the falling so much or the tearing stuff up. Uh, thank the Lord I've never broke anything. But I remember... I can't remember if it was my brother or, or my dad or probably both of them as I was learning to ride my, motor, my dirt bike. They said, if you look at what you don't want to hit, you will surely hit it. <laughs> and that stuck with me. You know, when, you're, when I'm going down a trail, I make sure I try not to look at those big rocks or the trees. Because I know if I focus on that, I'm going to hit it. And doesn't that just kind of sum up our lives? What we focus on, we will probably hit. And some of that stuff is going to hurt when we hit it. And it might break us. But my faith indicated that I aimed at the right thing and I reached it. So what are you aiming for? What is your focus on? Those believers who have come before have and have finished their race have shown us that it was by faith that we were redeemed by God's grace. We can be thankful for each person that you were thinking of this morning when I asked you to think of who influenced your faith. And we can think of many who have encouraged us, who have built this church and are part of even the, great, the greater kingdom of God. As the book of Hebrews indicates, it is not an easy race. It wasn't for those who came before us, and it's not going to be an easy race for anyone that comes after us. There will be many trials and things that make us ask ourselves, what is God doing? Right? I've asked that a lot. God, what are you doing here? Show me. Man, you must be confused. Or... Why, God, would you allow this? When we see pain and suffering of others, we ask ourselves, why, God, do these people have to go through this? But we are reminded that we are in a sinful world. A world that is broken that has suffering and has pain and loss and hunger. We have a promise of eternity.
and we have something to focus on. We have something that encourages us to go out into the world and help those who are in need, who are broken, who are hungry. Those of us who came before us, they worked hard, didn't they? And they passed the baton on to us to carry on the gospel to the world, to minister to those in need, to raise up the next generation of believers. They expected us to change the world because Jesus was the one who changed it on the cross. So go out and be the change. Do justice and proclaim Jesus is King. Amen. pray and respond for those things that bring us joy in our lives for our the things that we are concerned of as we share our joys and concerns this morning let us pray Dear God, I give you thanks and I just ask a blessing for each person that is here this morning with us. I just pray that you help them get through whatever it is they're going through because if anyone knows, it is you. And we give you thanks for that. Please, Lord, help us to be the hands and the feet to run this race. Lord, we give you thanks for our successful day yesterday at our picnic. We give you thanks for the beautiful weather that we had. Lord God, we give you thanks for Anne's new granddaughter who was born this past Monday. Lord, we give you joy for all of the life that is around us. And we give you thanks, Lord, for those who are there for us in a time of need. Lord God, we lift up all of these concerns to you. For Sharon Klein and Ronnie Benner, for Linda Glee, Rachel Eshelman, Bridget and Maurice, Ken and Jean Klein, for Billy Little, for Bruce Weatherly, Howard Sheely, for Jim Kunkel, and the surgery he will have this week for Tom and Joshua. Lord God, we lift up Pastor Mary as she goes through treatments for her cancer. Lord, we lift up Jim and Judy, Elaine, Ron Palmer, Gloria and Bob Ease, Jeannie and Gary Metz and Sharon Klein and her family, Lord. Lord God, we lift up all of those things that are on our hearts, the ones that we shared this morning and the ones that we keep hidden in our hearts. We know that you hear and you answer our prayers. Be with us this week as we go to love God and love our neighbor. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Now let us worship God by giving of our tithes and offering. If our usher will please come forward.
all these gifts to you that were given out of abundance and out of faith. May you continue to bless them and multiply them so that this church can do the ministry that you have called us to do. To reach those in need and to spread the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Amen. sing our closing hymn, O oh, Jesus, I Have Promised, number 396.
Don't forget that there's lunch that you can buy today after church. If you want soup or uh, maybe even sandwiches, uh, stop by the social hall and, and see Pat and um, help us out by getting rid of all the, the leftovers. So now, church, as you go from this place today, keep your eyes on Jesus. Have faith. Run the race and pour your faith into others so that the whole world may one day be overflowing with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.